Hello and welcome to our webinar series, Next Steps in COVID-19 Response and Long-Term Care. I'm Andrea Pichet, Senior Program Lead at Healthcare Excellence Canada, and I'm pleased to be your host today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples since the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge that we are broadcasting this webinar from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place and the opportunity to gather here today. We are pleased to offer French simultaneous translation and interpretation for this session. If you wish to hear the voice of the interpreter, please select French from the interpretation menu at the bottom of your screen. We invite you to share your questions and comments at any point using our chat box in either English or French and we encourage all of you to respond to each other's comments and answer questions in the chat as well. We will aim to connect as many of your questions as we can with our speakers during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. If you need support at any time during this webinar, you can reach out to our tech support using the chat feature. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website in the next couple of days to share or review with colleagues who may have missed it. Today, we're pleased to have two speakers to talk about family visitation and long-term care during COVID-19 and reframing research into practical strategies to improve practice. I am pleased to introduce Janice Keefe and Roberta Bishop. Janice Keefe is professor and chair of the Department of Family Studies and Gerontology at Mount St. Vincent University. She holds the Lena Isabel Jodry Chair in Gerontology and is director of the Nova Scotia Center on Aging. Dr. Keefe is an adjunct professor with Dalhousie's Faculty of Medicine and affiliate scientist with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. She is leading research examining the implementation of support visitations by family during COVID and is the scientific director of Pan-Canadian research program called Seniors, Adding Life to Years, which examines the quality of life for residents in long-term care. She chaired the Ministerial Expert Panel on Long-Term Care for Nova Scotia and contributed to the Royal Society of Canada's report on COVID-19 and long-term care. Roberta Bishop is the operations manager with Rainbow Rescue Center in Winnipeg and one of the four family advisors who supported the family visitation in long-term care during COVID-19 research project. Ms. Bishop is an educator by background and an active community volunteer. She collaborated on the development of the Proud, Prepared and Protected portal on the virtual hospice website. As a key support person to parents in long-term care and assisted living, she's committed to influencing change in care for older people through both personal and professional advocacy. This includes work with the Pan-Canadian Trek Voices Group, as well as playing an advisory role on the visitation project. Janice and Roberta, over to you. Thanks very much, Andrea, for that introduction. Yeah, very pleased to be talking to you today about some of the work that we've been doing on family visitation, particularly focusing on our practical strategies um, and uh, to improve the practice in, in long-term care facilities. Next slide, please. This uh, presentation, sorry, we'll come, uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, family involvement, give you an overview of the project, uh, about our approach to uh, knowledge translation, and then we'll give you some of the contents that form part of the practice briefs that we've sent out to all long-term care uh, facilities, as well as to the, um, uh, to the general public on our website. So we'll give you a link to that in the chat as well. Um, and then we'll have some time, I hope, for um, a summary as well as discussion from you on any questions that you may have for us. Next slide, please. So this project that I'm going to speak about is part of the um, uh, a family visitation project that was funded by Healthcare Excellence Implementation Science Teams, Strengthening the Pandemic Preparedness for Long-Term Care. So after um, months of long-term care and being locked down, family visitation programs and policies were introduced to reconnect the residents with their family and friends. So we spoke to uh, long-term care staff and family and friends in the summer 
and the spring, excuse me, and summer of 2021 to understand their experiences with the family visitation program in six facilities in uh, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. I just want to note that we, um, so we actually had uh, initially two points in time and then we went back uh, to HAC because in Nova Scotia and PEI, um, we had a significant Omicron variant. And so some of the facilities, particularly in PEI, but also in rural Nova Scotia, hadn't had uh, an out much of an outbreak. And so we went back just recently to time three to do some follow-up interviews. Really, our goal of this research was to assess the implementation, how that support visitation program were implement implemented from the perspective of directed uh, designated caregivers. So we had 38 in the beginning. We also talked to other family and friends, uh, 15 of those. And then we talked to over, uh, over 50 uh, staff, both implementation staff, as well as direct care staff that we followed the family members over the three points in time. Next slide, please. I should say, as we go, uh, just before I pass it over to Roberta, we're going to use the term uh, designated caregiver. So you'll see DCG, as that was the term used in, in Nova Scotia and a number of other provinces, uh, although PEI did use partners in care. Over to you, Roberta. Oops, my apologies. Thank you very much, Janice. Um, speaking of the importance of family, part of my responsibility here in this presentation is to extend our thoughts of what a family actually is. And that family isn't necessarily blood family, but oftentimes some of our residents who come into care, come into care um, as chosen family. So it's really important for the role of the family and, and the role that family members provide, regardless of birth family or chosen family, um, are to provide care, the emotional support, and socialization. And my part on the project was um, providing, even though I'm in Manitoba and much of the project took place in the Maritimes, um, my family was in care in Nova Scotia. And so that uh, afforded me the opportunity to speak to family in that regard. I helped advise on the project help the interviewees um, ask questions, frame the questions in an appropriate fashion, and also um, expand the idea and the thought of um, gender inclusivity and uh, not always using binary questions and, not, and expanding assumptions. Um, so I encourage all of us to extend our perception of what a family is. Next slide, Janice. I think I hope that oh, covered. Hey, yeah, that's great, Roberta. So Roberta was one of uh, four family advisors on the project. And um, we also had the six administrators of long-term care that we would meet up the, up the six facilities. So we met with them both together, but also separately so that we could uh, hone in on their areas of expertise as we looked at our findings and provided some interpretation of them. Um, so when we went to share the findings, of course, uh, we need to bridge that knowledge uh, uh, knowledge to action gap. Um, certainly we, um, we use different approaches. Um, we want to be able to take our research um, and help to translate it um, to enable that exchange between stakeholders that will result in action. I mean, we also want uh, those uh, outcomes to be evidence uh, based in decision making. You know, oftentimes, uh, Research needs to be have that scientific rigor and that is required to be published in peer reviewed journals, but we often uh, we consider it very important to share this research findings in other formats in more practical ways. So we did have in PEI and Nova Scotia, a webinar that's presented the findings to all nursing homes in that area. And we also developed these, what we call practice briefs that targeted different audiences, be the family members that participated, the staff, and the uh, long-term care uh, itself. So we tried to um, link the research with some practical recommendations and use that first voice of the family and the staff to draw out some of the practical uh, 
uh, opportunities to improve uh, their services. And I'll also talk about some of those challenging um, uh, common challenges that, that were experienced in, in long-term care. Next slide, please. So this is just an, uh, an overview of what you're not to read it. I mean, it's not very easy to read, but just to give you an overview of um, what a practice brief looks like. And maybe I can ask uh, Emily to uh, share the, the links uh, in, in the chat. So these are some of the actions. This particular one is around actions to take it from a staff point of view. We also have one on communication and we have one on impact. Uh, we have a, a fourth one that's forthcoming um, on the uh, perspective of the family. So it just is, you know, a two pager that looks at uh, what we found, um, some of the recommendations on the sidebar, and then just a very uh, simple what we did and wh who we talked to with some links to learning more about the research and how to reference this particular uh, document and of course our funders and our Center on Aging. So feel free to uh, uh, visit the Mount website and download these um, uh, uh, practice briefs. Unfortunately, we only have them in English uh, due to funding, but um, uh, I hope that that they may be helpful for individuals. Next slide, please. So what I wanna do is just to quickly um, go through what some of those findings were around improving communication and feedback. And I'm sure for many of you that are on the call, these will um, be uh, not uh, surprising, shall we say, uh, but, um, they do come from the perspectives of the family and so on. Um, so first of all, around um, communication and feedback, I've heard this over and over again, and I'm just gonna highlight the quote from the direct care staff. We were the last ones to, to know, but the first ones who needed to deal with that. And I heard that many, many times uh, as we did the interviews, but also at, at, at other tables. Um, the staff suggested that we have to think about multiple modalities when we start to communicate. There's in-person communication. This needs to be paired with emails, with memos, with social media. Um, we need to be transparent and open early on um, throughout each change because sometimes the staff didn't understand whether the, the, the rules were provincially driven or facility driven. Um, and that was important for them. Staff would also benefit, have benefited from hearing from feedback from families and residents through focus groups or targeted group meetings. They, there wasn't that opportunity. And in some cases, uh, you know, it was due to some of the shortage of staff and, and that, that the facilities were dealing with. Um, also enabling uh, staff to give direct input, input, so seek that input from staff um, in terms of how to improve the communication and feedback. Uh, from the family perspective, they also um, presented, uh, suggested different ways of diverse ways of communicating. Um, in some cases, the DCGs, the directed caregiver, designated caregiver, were not the power of attorney, and it was the power of the attorney that the facilities were in touch with. Um, and, and so that became um, a challenge, especially where there was uh, family dynamics at play. So a direct uh, designated caregiver would show up to the facility and realize that there was an outbreak and, and it was closed. The, the other thing uh, to provide some information sheets when um, uh, major changes occurred and recognize that while um, technology worked for most and was greatly appreciated, it didn't work for everyone. So there had to be, again, different ways of, of thinking. Clear masks would be really important to help with recognition and communication, um, especially for the residents that relied on uh, lip reading, a, a friendly smile, residents with dementia who didn't recognize their family, family members. So that often impacted negatively at their visit time. Um, we could also implement more formal processes for feedback or 
in some cases, virtual meetings where families can ask uh, questions about the program and uh, answer have them answered in real time. Now, I do know some of the facilities did undertake this, uh, but it also enabled uh, what came out from others in our study, and not just to communicate with the administrative staff of the facility, but also get that connection with family members who were also in the facility dealing with this because they uh, no longer had the opportunity to talk with them. So next slide please. So the first being uh, communication, the second being increase flexibility in the program. And coming from the staff, um, they really felt we could have allowed more designated family members. In uh, the two provinces where we were doing the study, PEI and Nova Scotia, uh, the staff recognized that it's difficult to choose one to three people, especially when some of the families are much larger. So who is the chosen three of the sons and daughters? And coming from a family of nine, I, I would see that as uh, a little bit of a challenge. Um, so how do you, how do you choose that? Um, the when the restrictions were um, were uh, more restrictive um, and required scheduling, uh, pa families really would have, our staff would, would have liked to see extra visits allowed. Uh, some families only had one visit a week um, for, and for, for some of those to be longer um, because sometimes the, the time slot was insufficient if the resident got agitated and then left and then they weren't able to actually have a visit. Um, there was a sense that when the resident was palliative that we should be easing on the mask requirements um, so that the resident and the family could be face to face during that time. Both the family and the staff called for normalcy, so given how rigid the, the visitation was for so long, many really missed being able to share a meal with the resident or having coffee together. And that put a lot of hardship, particularly on spouses um, who you know, were not, no longer able to touch the, the family member. From the family um, perspective, um, they wanted increased uh, visiting hours, particularly for working families. So thinking of it from a staff point of view, uh, a staffing point of view, uh, it might have been easier to find people from nine to five, but from a family perspective, getting there for before a five o'clock time slot uh, made it difficult. <clears throat> Flexibility uh, uh, was requested in terms of being able to swap in and swap out direct to designated caregivers so that, um, again, coming back to the bigger families aspect that uh, if a, a, a designated caregiver was going to be away for an extended period or they became ill, um, then it, there were some circumstances where they felt that they could the another individual could have been swapped in uh, for to allow for that visitation. And some homes did that, but some homes uh, did not. The other aspect was the varying impact of the visitation policy and how the blanket approaches are not best practice uh, and can really impact on different uh, types of families. So rural uh, impacts residents with uh, rules, sorry, impact residents with dementia differently. So if you're required to stay in your own home, et cetera, wandering, this can be an issue. So they, um, I think this quote kind of talks about this around, you know, the, the challenge with not recognizing the, the uh, spousal visitor here that oftentimes is looked at as uh, uh, the older person and their adult child. But th they, you know, as the person said that um, they weren't allowed uh, to lay in bed and cuddle as much as they love to be present, they didn't get the full benefit of living their life. And they didn't think that was fair. Next slide, please. So the final sort of key finding that is uh, acknowledged in the um, in the practice briefs is this recognition and support for staff. Um, so from the staff perspective, they felt they needed more training and education at the beginning, um, specifically around 
rules that they had to be followed and also around support for uh, families for interacting with families who had uh, in terms of mediation um, uh, in order to be able to diffuse situations uh, with family members. Um, the other was to have some type of recognition um, or a reward program for the staff that often go un, unrecognized. So we're thinking here of some of the direct care staff, the, the long-term care assistants that were in uh, the province of Nova Scotia, housekeeping, dietary, they're not always viewed as um, included within that uh, nursing care at, at the long-term care facility. So a real uh, emphasis on uh, moving across different uh, and recognizing the value of having housekeeping, for example, to ensure cleanliness and infection control. Also to partner with organizations to support family and staff mental health, um, even if it's just to have someone come uh, to check to see how they're doing. Um, there is a real strong emphasis on that from the, uh, from the staff. Similar things uh, from family, they definitely recognized the need for more staffing and became aware when there was a decrease in staff, especially uh, during the Omicron variant, uh, where many staff were off because of exposure or having COVID themselves. Um, so it made it difficult for families then to find someone to talk to if they were having an issue or if they had difficulty um, scheduling a visitation. But family were, uh, you know, expressed many, many times their appreciation um, and applauded uh, staff for doing everything that they could at this time. Um, they did suggest more volunteer resources, especially with uh, screening at the door. Um, certainly some, uh, some homes, recreation or nursing staff were taken away from their homes in order to do screening. And this impacted on the res uh, residents uh, res, uh, recreation activities. Finally, just to sort of sum up this sort of area of this is to, um, next slide please, is to say that all of the findings that we are talking about here involves context. And I think that's a really important factor. Um, some of the programs, um, you know, the, the, the policy directive would may have come from the chief medical, uh, chief public health officer, and then had to get implemented either at the health authority level or the ministry level. And, you know, and then it, it was, um, sent out to the long-term care facilities and uh, often they got it at the same time as it was being released to the public and so in many cases uh, the staff and also the administrators explained to us that they really didn't have the the flexibility with this family visitation program as they did with other past programs so this was um this was different in that regard. They certainly uh, felt that um, there was a rationale for why it was that way, but it was also, I think, a challenge in terms of um, the families understanding uh, the different contexts of the what the facility could do, and also the different physical design issues um, that the facility uh, would have access to. So the whole issue of the six feet apart in some facilities is very difficult to be able to manage when uh, families were, were visiting. Next slide, please. So just as a, you know, applica uh, uh, application of our insights, we're going to pass it over to Roberta to get us going on some of those practical considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, very much. Um, some of the things to really consider about is the 
amount of the the importance of the role of family members and again to reiterate family being chosen family or birth family or those who are recognized as caregivers however they are defined um, we have to think about the fact that sometimes for some families and uh, that one approach may not be the exact same as the other as for other families and different families have different um desires of communication and um, approaches to how that they can um, look after things. And staff perceptions, what might be best for what some staff may not really be the best for all the families that with whom the staff is involved. Um, it's important and it's very it's imperative that family members understand their the role that they play in the uh, prevention and transmission, um, both for potentially sharing of um, in infections as well as being, becoming infected themselves. And um, the importance in this part of the research, we found that as we help to inform the questions and uh, perhaps um, spread the ideas of, of questions that were being asked of um, the caregivers and trying to find out what are some of the best approaches and how are things actually working is giving the chance for people to um, actually be heard and listened to and not just um, asked a question and without waiting for a response for the answer, whether it be for the caregivers or for the family members. Um, when taking a look to at sharing the information of the program, how the program's going to work, how it's going to be applied, is explaining sort of why we're doing things, how things are being done, and what the overall goal and objective is. And um, for in, in future, in taking a look at um, the program, the visitation program as it was set up, which is inclusive of the various parts and components and those things that um, brought comfort to residents and as well as to family members, but perhaps being able to use it for a blueprint for any of the future. Um, future outbreaks. We can learn. We can learn from what we've done so far. And it's important to share the knowledge and to share the information and to continue to ask the questions. Is that uh, covering off those? those? Yeah, thanks. Slides? Thanks, Roberta. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I would just add the the whole family centered lens, I think, just to reiterate as as people develop these protocols and and um, that are clearly necessary, um, you know, to have that sort of, and I know we didn't have a lot of opportunity for, you know, second thoughts on this, uh, but um, what does that mean for family? What does it mean for the resident in terms of their quality of life to be doing things this particular way? And we certainly did hear a lot from the, from the staff and from the administrators that, you know, going forward, I think, the, the program is a blueprint that allows us to perhaps open be open more during flu season with specific protocols and uh, you know when influenza hits when someday COVID is out of our out of our reach as well so yeah no that that pretty much uh, you know sums it up for us in terms of um, of the application for that uh, our study. Um, we, next slide, please. We do want to, uh, you know, uh, basically we're all, we are all about the family perspective and the value of doing, of including family. Um, and I want to uh, spend a moment just to acknowledge uh, my co-authors and co-principal authors, uh, Stephanie Chamberlain and Melissa Andrew. Um, we also had, uh, and our co-authors, Mary Jean Handy, uh, Tamara Krachenko, uh, Grace Warner, and Laurie Weeks. And we had a number of uh, master's students that worked on the projects and did the interviews with guidance from the family advisors. They did pre-interviews with the family advisors to make sure they, they would do well. Um, we also had a number of administrators and partners that participated in the research. And of course, the wonderful individuals that um, participated with us, um, the family members that gave their time um, over three points in time. We have about 24 family that we have from three points in time. 
um, and uh, and also the staff who took some time out of their day to to be interviewed and to provide their their insights. So I do appreciate all of all of my team. Roberta and I are just the face today, um, and uh, you can see that we come from multiple different universities and also have ethical approval from all of the universities as well as Health PEI. So final slide. So if you're interested and uh, looking forward to some of your comments and questions, if you want more information, you have my email address there. You also have the links to the, uh, to the practice briefs. Please, please feel free to share those widely. We want, we want to get them out and come back to the website um, at the Nova Scotia Centre on Aging for, for more information to be able to provide, um, to, get, to get the message broader further. So thank you very much on behalf of Roberta and myself. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much, Janice and Roberta. I think this was a really meaningful example of how, you know, doing research um, that really elevates the voices of those who are most impacted um, by a particular situation you know, can then really start to leverage change in practice. And the fact that you've developed these, these practice briefs as that tool for taking your research and helping to fold it into um, the new ways that, that organizations are developing their practices, particularly around visit, family visitation and uh, being inclusive of all types of care partners um, is really a, a wonderful example um, of the work that's going on. We have lots of comments and, and questions. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to bring these to you. And I'd like to just also invite folks to continue to add your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll continue to monitor them throughout this Q&A period. And if for some reason you have a, a question or a comment that um, doesn't get elevated in this time period, um, we will forward them on to Janice and Roberta and hopefully be able to provide you with a response from them after this, uh, this webinar. So please, uh, you know, don't be intimidated by the number of questions coming in thinking if I add another one, it's not going to get answered. Uh, we endeavor to try and get an answer to all of your questions, whether it's in this time period or, or shortly after. But, um, you know, certainly early on, there were some comments that really showed some of the, the parts that were resonating with people, um, you know, particularly around the use of terminology and essential care partners and designated caregivers and just some gratitude for, um, you know, the expansion um, of the, uh, the language in this project. Um, also a comment uh, acknowledging, you know, the recommendation of a reward program, um, specifically for workers in other departments and some of the unsung heroes that play such a vital role in providing care and keeping the organizations um, running. Um, one of the first questions that came in was whether you got a sense that the facilities were able to provide any feedback, any impact feedback to public health about why these restrictions or mandates um, were implemented and how much communication typically happens in that way. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And so um, I, my understanding is that um, there have been discussions between the uh, public health offices and some of the long-term care ministries. I was not part of that. Uh, we have, we did certainly invite them to the the webinar when we presented our findings. Um, and so we do think that that is important. There was a lot of things on their plate, obviously, um, but long-term care was a, a, a critical component and, 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 you know, understanding the nature of long-term care that it is the resident's home as opposed to a hospital, I think is a really important facet that we have to, to think about for the future. So I, I can't directly comment on how much consultation there was, but I, I certainly feel from my interactions with the sector that there's been more um, recognition of the value of that, uh, can I say as well. Thank you for that. Um, and the next question centers around, you know, the importance of why and, and being able to answer why is often an important part of explaining a directive to families. Um, and, you know, would you be willing to comment on evidence-based decision-making that's involved in family visitation and when is an evidence-informed decision required? 
So an evidence-informed decision around when a family member is allowed, please come and lay the case to me, and when an evidence-informed decision is required. I mean, I think having evidence about the value of the, the role of these designated caregivers in the quality of life, and even in some cases, the quality of care for residents um, is something that not only our research is pointing to in a qualitative way, but we've recognized in, in some of the data that we're now looking at um, in terms of that excess um, mortality. Um, I, I, one of the things that surprised us, I'll be quite honest, with the third wave of the, um, of the uh, collection of data from family members. So recall that we did the wave one and wave two in the spring and summer of uh, 2021. And then March, 2020, and we presented our findings. We've been, we've been trying to get out to share what those findings are to get these practice briefs out about best practices. And then when we went back to those 24 uh, family members and asked them if they had been consulted about, you know, inclusion in the way in which the policies were enacted, there was very little of that. And so they spoke about, you know, I, I gave my opinion, uh, you know, I'd make suggestions, but they were never acted upon. And so there's a, a bit of a disconnect there, I think that I, I wanted to share because I think it's, um, you know, we have great intentions, but in the heat of the moment, I think those can uh, fall to the wave, way, wayside if you're in the middle of an outbreak. And I, I do understand that context matters, but it's also what, you know, thinking about how to be inclusive of family and staff during that implementation process. I don't know, Roberta, if you have a comment on that as well, like how to be better informing of family well, I think that um, it absolutely, it's important that family members um, are consulted and um, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, you know, I, I think that sometimes we have to realize and recognize that we are part of the process and that we have a right to um, ask questions and to be informed. And that yes, respecting that uh, times are busy and things, I'm just looking at some of the comments coming through the chats that are saying there's not clarity always when an edict is read, no, that's the government policy. The clarity for the end the consumer, the family member, it's like, okay, who is it? If we, if we can understand, is this a hospital or, or a home directive? Is this a provincial directive? Is this a federal directive? If we can understand under what we're operating, it makes it an awful lot easier, um, you know, a lot of, uh, easier to swallow that pill to, to do what we can and then to make suggestions and to hopefully have suggestions follow even just within our own immediate environment. Thank you. Thank you for those rich responses. Um, I think, you know, this sort of builds on to that as the next step, this question, which is really, you know, given that the rules and the policies and the procedures were handed down from public health and the health ministries, um, you know, during the outbreaks and during the lockdowns, you know, do you have plans to present your research to the ministries of health in order to um, have them look at some of your data and, and some of the impact measures that you've collected um, so that your research can inform future decisions? Absolutely. We, we've already done that, actually. We, we did that in the fall of 2021. Um, we invited the ministry um, both in, in both provinces. Now, we haven't gone across ministries. We presented this to the International Long-Term Care COVID group uh, underway. We've presented it at Canadian Association of Gerontology. And we also have a group that's uh, 
that has, you know, that are funded by uh, the Health Healthcare Excellence Canada uh, that are in the area of family caregiving. So we've met regularly and shared our results with each other. And, and we're currently in the process of writing a paper about what some of our key findings are from the perspective uh, of family. So um, I think we're, we're trying to, um, to get that message out in any way we can about how to inform it. I, I, I also, uh, I noticed that I think there was a really good comment I just want to make, like, sometimes at homes, like the clarity of the trans, uh, transparency of who's actually making the decision is even difficult for researchers to understand because we're getting perspectives from family and from staff. So it's following the trail of the policy. And we tried to do that. Like what was the, what was the statement by the chief uh, public health officer? And then when, when was the implementation or the memo sent to the homes? And then was what happened in the homes, what was in, like how much leeway, and, and, and there's a comment, and I, I agree, you know, it's great to say this afterwards, I mean, that's not the comment, but you didn't have a lot of time to process it, like I'm, you know, and I, I think that's why it's really important to have that slide around context matters here, everyone was doing the best they could, that never happened before. I mean, I just think that's really critical. But I also think, you know, uh, that we have to learn from other ways of doing things and, and, and maybe think about that as we prepare for other events, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it's this, it's this hard part where, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and looking back, we can, you know, we can see this with clarity, but, you know, was it possible to even have that level of clarity at that time, given, um, you know, the number of decision makers involved and in the complexity of the situation? So, uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, the effort that you've described in trying to really trace that thread um, so that we're not just applying hindsight bias, but we're really trying to learn, um, you know, how do we make decisions in the moment when we're faced with this level of complexity again, which is really challenging. Now, one of the questions that came in really ties to our, our previous webinar, which talked about, you know, bringing families in designated care um, support in to take on some of the direct care responsibilities um, and efforts for the resident. And so given the staff shortages that might have been happening in long term care at the time that you were um, involved in doing interviews, you know, were, did, did this, was this happening in the facilities that you were working with? And how was this received by um, the family member or the resident? So in fairness, we didn't ask about how much care they were physically providing. So our, our main objective um, of our uh, project, the research question, if you will, is what were the factors that contributed to a positive implementation of family visitation? And what were some of the barriers that um, affected the the smooth implementation of the barriers of the uh, sorry family visitation, as well as what was the outcome or the impact of the program on the residents and on the family. So just to put that in context, because I know um, from other work that we've done, and I think you've had some um, uh, presenters that have been able to hire family to get them in during that time. I mean, we've, we've, there's all kinds of innovations that people have looked at. Um, we didn't answer, we didn't ask that question specifically. So anything I say here is just what may have come out. Um, we certainly know when they got back in, there was some opportunity to help with you know, in in their own room with with some feeding or that kind of thing, but but um, we didn't like definitively measure how much care they provided in this study. So I just want to be cautious about that. Yep. No, not a problem. Um, just. Moving down here to uh, more, this one's a, more of a comment, but I think it, it invites, um, you know, some, some feedback um, from you as well, which is um, 
you know, while staff training and education is essential and staff recognition helps as an incentive, you know, another factor is perhaps leaders' formal and informal skills and effectiveness in the domains of emotional, relational, and social intelligence. And perhaps that is what matters most in, in making a positive impact on the team and the organizational culture and how we engage with families. And just, and do you have any thoughts really around you know, the leader type of leadership skills um, mm. that really support um, some of these efforts in, in the most meaningful way. Yeah, um, that's a great comment. Um, just, uh, <laughs> I think it's critically important. I think those communication skills are, they start at the top and they, and they go down, like that open door, that, that, thinking ahead, you know, some of the, um, some of the administrators in our study um, had been thinking about what might happen and how, if they got, so in Nova Scotia, we did have a large outbreak at Northwood early on. I'm, many of you would have heard about it and, and that, you know, a lot of attention was given to that and uh, people who were you know, kind of those thinkers, okay, so what will we do? You know, this is how will we manage this? Let's start to let's talk about this. So they took it their own initiative versus others who may have been a bit more passive uh, in that approach, um, I think is really important. And, and that that whole interpersonal uh, communication, open door, engaging your staff to be feel uh, you know, supported, uh, I think is, is also uh, really, really critical. And one more thing I would say just from a project we're doing on mental health is the role that the, those administrators, like the amount of burden that administrators had on themselves as they uh, both, you know, tried to manage what was being provided, but also uh, trying to support their staff who were undergoing other challenges in the community, be it having to homeschool their kids or having a partner that lost their position. And so there was all of that, you know, and as you say, Andrea, there's a lot of complexity here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think there is a lot of complexity and also don't, uh, don't forget, and I just, I do want Roberta to comment at some point about that, you know, how, how this may have affected different groups differently. And, you know, especially, um, you know, uh, some of the activities that Roberta has been uh, involved in, in terms of, uh, you know, planning with pride and like the, the experiences of uh, different communities, I think are really valuable because we're, we are a diverse population uh, within, within long-term care. Thanks, thanks, Janice. Uh, yes, uh, um, absolutely. There is uh, um, a great deal of diversity within the within the um, community within our within our population at large. Um, and uh, the coming back to Andrea's question, one of the questions in regards to leadership and things like that, the the role and the difficult and the complexities, that's very much a part of it. And um, there has to be some level of perhaps acceptance, even without understanding um, some of the nature of relationships and, and um, especially one of the um, aspects of things that I'm most concerned about is now as our older adults, some um, with dementia in the community, in, in care facilities who um, revert back to their lives of 60 years ago. Uh, at that time, they were uh, being persecuted. It was illegal to be gay. However, one describes that letter of the alphabet or the 2S LGBTQ plus um, um, acronym, and uh, it uh, it really really impacts the um, safety of an individual, and also it can be quite um, challenging for community members who do want to be supportive and say, "Don't worry about it, don't worry about it." But the realities in our older adults heads their realities of, of what they have. Now, Janice has mentioned about um, speaking about uh, proud, prepared and protected. And uh, that's uh, something I worked on with virtual hospice. I can include it in the link that uh, for some of you who might be interested in the um, in, in the resource, it also has a um, very useful um, if I can go and do this properly. It also has um, some great links as um, 
a, a wealth of links and information um, for consideration. And it's not just for those in palliative care, but just um, having us ask some questions of ourselves and think about the people that we are, are working with and uh, and caring for. And Janice and I had a discussion about, although we speak to, about the capital LTC long-term care, but to remember that we're providing care over the long-term um, in a variety of you know situations and that's what we need to focus on. Thanks, Roberta. Absolutely. And I guess before we leave the topic of inclusivity, there is also a specific question in the chat mm -hmm. around um, the inclusion of Indigenous participants in the research and whether you were, uh, you were able to, to bring that voice into the work. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this was more of a case, we went by facilities who participated. So um, we didn't seek out specific groups uh, um, to participate. We had anyone who had a resident in uh, one of the six long-term care facilities were uh, asked if they were open to receive a, a phone call. Um, I don't believe that we do because the facilities weren't, um, well, we actually in, in Nova Scotia and PI don't have separate care facilities uh, for Indigenous populations. So um, that doesn't mean to say that some of our caregivers weren't Indigenous, but we didn't collect that information. Um, if it was, I think it would have been fairly minor. We weren't in the regions where there are more uh, populations of Indigenous people, like in um, Eskasoni and Cape Breton, or um, you know, uh, yeah, near Lennox Island and PEI. So um, I don't think so. We certainly can't comment on it, unfortunately. Um, but it's a great it's a great question. It's just not something that um, we're able to speak about. Okay, thank you for responding to that. Um, there's a, a question that just came in sort of around leveling the playing field. And, you know, we know that each individual province and Ministry of Health um, you know, developed its own policies around things like visitation and vaccine and staff and visitors. And, you know, do you see the potential for your research to inform some better national LTC specific guidelines and policies? You know, do you think going forward, we may have a more coordinated response um, that could leverage your research? Yeah, well, I would definitely say yes to that. I mean, I'm a member of the the technical committee for the National Standards of Long Term Care. So some of the experiences that um, families and staff have expressed in this research, I've definitely brought forward to try um, around that person and family centered care approach. Uh, recognizing too, uh, we do have residents on the on the committee, and and you know the need to. Uh, have the resi resident designate who they want the family to be, w whether it's a family or a friend or a partner or whomever. It's it really is the the resident that, if possible, has the the first voice in that decision making. So definitely, uh, this research has been shared with the committee, and um, and I've been actively involved in helping to write the standards. So I, I'm hoping that um, there's not a watering down of those that when they get released in the fall. I suspect not. We have very strong uh, members off the committee, committee and, and a very strong leader in Dr. Sina. That's really promising. I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe talk a little bit about your actual practice briefs themselves, the tools, um, because I think that the audience on this call um, represents a group who would potentially put them into action. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for the organizations here on this call around how do you implement the content of, of the briefs that you've created? How do they go from just being something that lives on paper to something that lives in action? And have you worked with any facilities that you, know, you could share any lessons learned from? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, so, so I would encourage people to uh, to look at the briefs. To um, I, I think they can be used sort of as a uh, catalyst for 
um, communication. So if you're a family member of a council or you're uh, in an organization that's trying to improve the quality of life for residents in long-term care, um, I think it's really valuable to look at perspectives of the staff as well as perspectives of the family. Um, the whole issue, I would say, um, is communicate, communicate, communicate all the time. Uh, I think it's really uh, one of the things that um, is, is critically important. Um, and so, and also like to recognize that, um, you know, different facilities have different physical layouts, they have different like cultures within the facility. And so how do you move or shift that culture from one to the other? And I, I think that's really important. I know um, one of the comments I was sort of following along earlier on said, you know, that wasn't their experience because family members were afraid to come into the facility um, because they were scared of getting COVID. And, and that you know, I'm not saying so. So I think the context here is really important. This is PEI that didn't have an outbreak, I think, until the fall of 2021 in their long term care facilities. OK, so keep that in mind. And then you have four homes in Nova Scotia that had very few outbreaks until the third wave. On to, sorry, not the third wave, the Omicron wave, which was number five or whatever. So like that's really critical context. They were less, they were, they were both, uh, you know, in the third wave, they did talk about the fear of getting it, but also the fear of bringing it in because it was rampant then um, in, uh, just thinking of an example, uh, someone in PEI, it spread through the schools, the children were bringing it home. The grandparent was afraid to go visit her mother because she might bring it in. Everyone was afraid. So I, I appreciate that, what you're saying. And I think it, it says something about family visitation programs that actually we put all these rules and regulations, but most family don't want to bring COVID into their nursing home. Like, you know, it's just like, we're going to do everything we can. We'll put on masks, we'll do whatever you want. But, you know, there, there's, yeah, anyway. So I, I do think, um, I think there's opportunities for that dialogue. I hope there is with the, uh, with the facility and the culture of the facility, as well as with, uh, you know, pushing for these standards that they're not, they're not just standards for some homes that are accredited, but they really become standards for our long-term care system across Canada, regardless of what province you're in. I mean, we that's where we want to go. I think we should be going. Anyway, I'm on my little soapbox here, so I'll, I'll let Roberta respond to you too. <laughs> Um, I, soapboxes are allowed, of course, because these are things which we're passionate about. And, and that's something when asking what we can do with the briefs and what we can do with them, not only just uh, try to share with them sort of up in the hierarchy of things, but also um, among our colleagues. And, you know, did you know this piece of research was happening? What do you think? What can we do about it? And what are we doing in our own homes? What are we doing in our own long term care facilities? that uh, can help address and support these and, and show the show the work of these things. I also agree, absolutely. I think that family members and visitors are the ones who really did not want to carry in anything. And, um, you know, that they were, as as uh, Andy spoke earlier in his comment, that the the isolation that was there to protect those that we love and, and the stress that we put ourselves through in order that we could have those um, um, moments and, and be feel free to be able to walk in with a with a with a clear conscience, I think is terribly important. Terribly important. So um, I'm not sure what what further to, to comment on there. <laughs> No, I think that's fantastic, Roberta. And I think this passion that you're both sharing is echoed in the comments, like just reading them through, I can really feel, um, you know, the passion in, in the lived experience of, of those who are, who are chiming in. So, uh, you know, very well warranted. We, uh, we're, we're down to the last two minutes here. Um, and so I, there is one question that I'll forward up as our last question only because I, I think that you'll be able to address it uh, with very short timing. And again, it just follows on this question of the practice briefs. And 
how did you decide that this was going to be the best method to translate what you had learned? That's a great question. Uh, I would say we didn't decide it was the best method. Method. It's one method. We do a lot of methods. Uh, webinars, I think, are really valuable. Face-to-face -face, uh, discussions with ministry people when we're talking with them. Uh, presentations at different conferences. We're at Northwood. Uh, they, we have a big provincial conference sponsored by a local nursing home. We'll be presenting these results, too. So it's one method. It's a tangible hand hands-on thing that we try to make it so it's very practical and in and, and you know just to think about we emailed it to all the participants the family and the staff that we had emails for which was was in the family's case most of them and we hope that it moves further um in the past we've done this uh you know just simple uh, two pager and people have referenced it significantly. So I, yeah, uh, that's, it's been helpful in the past. I can't tell you the measurement. That's always the issue with knowledge translation. Is it better to do that than the webinar? I think we need to do everything. Um, and, you know, we need to hear these messages again. So they just become a little bit more innate and we, we build on them. Thank you. And I hope our audience helps to carry on, um, you know, the longevity and the utility of the tools that you started and continues to build on them. So thank you so much to both of our speakers for sharing today. And thank you to all of you, our audience, for joining this webinar. Just a quick plug for our next webinar. Uh, it will be on July 18th, and we'll be discussing engagement-capable environments. Um, and I think that you will really enjoy that material as well. Um, Please, if you can take a moment here to fill out the poll that's already up on the screen. There's just a few questions. You know, was the webinar useful? Did it provide useful information? Are you intending to share what others have learned? Do you know more about this topic than you did before participating in this webinar? And what topics would you like to see um, covered in the future one? And I think you, I see some early responses already coming in. So once again, I'd just like to thank you, Janice and, and Roberta, for your excellent presentation today. And of course, thanks to you, our audience, for joining us. This concludes today's event, and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks everyone for the active engagement. It was really, really enjoyable. Thanks indeed.